Okay. The first the first question you will ask uh, will yeah. be Hello and a very warm welcome to our event on investment uh, firepower for the recovery, a conversation with Philippe Donnet, whom I really want to welcome um, very warmly today. Uh, Philippe Donnet is the CEO of the Generali Insurance um, and is today calling in um, from actually his office in Milan. Um, where he hasn't been a lot um, in the last, uh, I guess, um, uh, 18 months. Um, and we were just chatting before we started this conversation and this, um, this event um, that actually the last time we met was um, for an event at Bruegel right before the pandemic. I think it was back in February of last year. And uh, it feels really not a year ago, it feels a decade ago. So we really, I think, have been through an extraordinary period. Um, and um, of course, this is not what we want to discuss here. Um, we want to discuss here, um, uh, you know, the role of um, the financial sector, in particular insurances um, uh, that they can play um, in the recovery phase that we have now entered um, after this biggest recession uh, since uh, World War II that the European Union and the world experienced um, last year. And so, so really understanding better um, what is missing, how can we uh, ensure financing is there? Uh, is there a role for insurance and what kind of role is there? But before, um, and since this is really also a conversation with um, uh, the CEO um, of a major uh, European company, I do think I wanna spend a bit of time, uh, if you allow me, um, Monsieur Donet, Philippe, um, to, to really start off by, by sort of thinking about the last 12 months or 18 months, which has been a tremendous challenge also for you as, I, I mean, for you, but also for everyone um, as a manager also, as a manager of a team, as a manager of a big institution. Um, and perhaps you can just give us a sense of really how Generali has adapted um, to this um, this uh, extraordinary disturbance, uh, disturbance, and the fact that you haven't been in the office, and you know how 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 is all of this played out? I think it's before we sort of move to the um, investment and macro picture. Um, I think sort of just give us a sense of how how has been this period for you. Thank, thank you, Gertram, and uh, good uh, good afternoon, every, everyone. Um, Yes, I think that uh, we uh, realized uh, quite quickly that we were entering a, a different world and uh, that we had to adapt immediately to, 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 this new, to this new world without knowing what was going to, to happen. It was a very strange feeling for all of us uh, personally, but also professionally. As you know, we are operating uh, our business in uh, almost 50 countries. Uh, we have uh, 70,000 employees uh, uh, in those uh, 50 countries. And the, the uh, number one priority was to be able to uh, have our people working in safe conditions and in the same time to ensure business continuity because we, we had to care about our customers and about our distributors. So we had to find the a solution uh, in a couple of days uh, to be able to, to have our 70,000 colleagues working from home, ensuring a full business continuity and a full support to distributors and um, customers. If I, I had uh, uh, our IT department to organize this, they, they would have told me I was crazy and that they needed uh, two years to, to make it possible. Actually, they made it possible in two weeks. Uh, and we all learned a new way of working, in, including with my management team. At the beginning, we were using only the phone. We had only meetings uh, by, by phone. And then we learned Zoom, we learned uh, Microsoft Teams and, and all the, the, the platforms. And we learned another way of working together. I must say that uh, we didn't lose any productivity. Uh, our people have been safe, uh, our business has been safe, uh, and at the end, 
we will keep this benefit because uh, all of this will not disappear even when we will uh, come back to a more normal situation. I think we will keep a significant part of this new world uh, we, we, we learned. Well, I mean, I, I have to say this is really a fascinating topic and I want to push you on one more question really in the, uh, on this topic before we come to the actual topic of our conversation. Because I think all of us um, also, uh, we at Bruegel, we are thinking, you know, how do we go back and, you know, what will be um, sort of the new model, the new work model. Um, and I think in a sense, um, you are quite comparable to us uh, because most of you, um, I, I, I mean, you don't have a manufacturing side. So, so it's all basically desk, desk office workers. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we are thinking a lot about what's the best hybrid way of going back because you do, I do, I do think at least um, that's our feeling that um, we do value the personal interactions and we want to go back to having some personal meetings again. At the same time, as you just said, there's also enormous benefits to having this teleworking uh, world. So, so how, do, I mean, how, how do you see this um, going forward? Well, we are obviously uh, thinking about it. Uh, we started uh, discussing it as well with the, the unions because it's uh, uh, very important the way we are going to organize uh, the way we, we work. Definitely, there are some benefits in uh, coming less often to the office. It's better for the environment. Uh, it's better for the environment to reduce our office uh, facilities, our office space. But in the same time, we, we understood the value of meeting people and working together with, uh, with people. So as a matter of fact, we think that it's important to uh, continue uh, coming to the office when we have to meet our colleagues and to share uh, things with our colleagues. Obviously, when it's about uh, making some, some work that do not require interaction with others, but it's something that we can do from, from home and, and, and it's better to do it from home. So at the end, as you said, it, the model will be hybrid. Our view is probably that a good balance would be 60% um, of the time in the office and 40% uh, at home. That's our view. We also believe that it has to be organized. It cannot be uh, only based uh, on uh, the choice of the people uh, because uh, it, it really has to be organized because people have to come to meet for group and team activities. Uh, so uh, in the same time, people who want to come every day to the office, they will be allowed to come every day to the office for some personal reasons. Uh, nobody will be allowed to stay uh, the whole time at home. Uh, so uh, we will organize it, but I would say that the framework will probably uh, be around 60, 40, 60 in the office, 40 at home. Wonderful, Fasc fascinating. Um, so so let's, let's now turn to um, the recovery and investment in the recovery. And let me also remind our audience that um, if you want to ask a question, uh, please go on Slido and uh, type in the code um, investment. Um, uh, it's also available on the website. And then I will see uh, whatever you send on the smartphone um, and be able in a later part of the conversation to ask those questions to, uh, to uh, Philippe Donnet. So, so please don't forget to ask your questions. Um, so so let's, let's go to, um, to the topic, um, the, the recovery and the financing of the recovery. I mean, per perhaps we start off by, you know, how you see um, the recovery going at the moment. I mean, what are I do you see a strong recovery? Do you see big risks? Um, and where do you see um, the investment needs uh, to be the biggest? No, I think that we we can be quite uh, optimistic because uh, recovery is coming, and uh, we, recovery will uh, will come uh, even more. And we we. We all need to be quite uh, positive. We all need uh, re recovery um, and it's going to happen. The risk is uh, to, to, to give up uh, some uh, 
sustainability uh, needs. Uh, the, we, we don't need any kind of recovery. Uh, I think we should forget about coming back to the previous world. This is not going to happen. And we need to transform this into an opportunity because if we don't come back to the previous world, it's positive and it has to be positive. And we have to make it positive because everything was not positive in the previous world. We said it many times. Uh, we said many times that we needed to change many things in our behaviors, personal behaviors, corporate behaviors. Uh, and we said that we needed to accelerate on, uh, on sustainable growth. Uh, this is an opportunity to, to do some reset and to, uh, to accelerate uh, the, the sustainability targets, uh, for example, on the, on the climate change, because uh, uh, we are convinced in, in generally that there is a, a real emergency uh, on climate and uh, we all share the responsibility to address um, as soon as possible uh, the, the the climate uh, the climate issue so um the risk is to give up uh, sustainability and to look for any kind of recovery i would say this is a political risk uh, this is not uh, an investment risk because uh, i'm very proud to say that but i think that investors are not cynical investors are responsible long term investors are really pushing for a better world, for a more sustainable world, for a more inclusive world. And I'm very proud of this uh, because maybe, you know, uh, this time cynicism is not on the, the finance side, is not on the investor side, but maybe uh, in some case can be on the politician side. And we need to fight cynicism. Uh, we need to uh, feel responsible. And I think that we need to help politicians because they don't have an easy job. Uh, they need to deal with public opinion. Uh, they have a lot of pressure. And we need to really help them to invest in this sustainable recovery. As you know, the insurance industry is a strong one. We have seen that during the pandemic crisis. Uh, we didn't have the same issues as the, as the banking industry. We've been demonstrating uh, the solidity of the, of the whole industry, particularly uh, our solidity in general. And not only we provide protection as insurance, but as you know, we are also a long-term uh, investor and we can provide long-term capital. And our responsibility as the industry as of today is to um, be able to, to direct uh, this long-term capital on uh, the needs of the economy for a sustainable recovery. And this is what we are trying to do in, in generally. Well, let's, I mean, there was a lot of material here. Uh, let's, let's try to unpack perhaps the various points in a, in a bit more detail. I mean, I, I think the first issue um, that I want to push you on a little bit more is this question of sustainability and the, um, the, the need to have a sustainable recovery. I mean, of course, this is what um, is the official um, uh, line um, uh, that the Commission and the European Union is advancing. Um, and it's it's very much um, also discussed in the slogan "Build Back Better" that uh, President Biden um, is putting forward. So the uh, this notion of not just building back, but building back better. So better meaning, I guess, more sustainable, more uh, more more social, more more equitable, and so on and so forth. Now, I guess um, the cynicist, which we I guess, which you say we need to fight, the cynicist would say. Um, well, yes, but I mean, can we afford uh, a green recovery if if we don't create the jobs we need? I mean, don't we need to primarily focus at this stage on job creation, um, making sure that people go back to work, and if the if the work had been, uh, uh, you know, uh, building building a car, um, a combustion engine car, or if the work had been building a coal fired power plant. Um, you know, then perhaps that's what we should um, prioritize. So, so why why this focus on sustainable? And I mean, first of all, do you think we can actually 
achieve it beyond the words? Um, um, and, you know, will it not go at the expense of um, employment and, um, you know, the, the normal working jobs? Well, th th this is uh, the central question. And uh, uh, for me, this is the central risk because I, I think that this is not uh, the real alternative. Uh, we don't have to choose uh, between uh, creating jobs and, for example, taking care of the environment. Because if uh, this uh, was the, the real question, it would be a nightmare. How can you make this kind of choice? It's impossible. I think that if we are not able to provide jobs to almost everyone, uh, we, we cannot build a sustainable society. But in the same time, if we cannot take care of our environment, of, of the planet, uh, it doesn't make any sense because we are we will create jobs, but we will destroy the planet. So, no, I think it's possible to do both. And this is really important. So for me, it's important not to give up uh, the sustainable goals. Uh, this is really important. And in the same time, I am convinced that we can create jobs and for almost everyone. It's, as you, it's also a matter of transition. Uh, we need to manage transition. And transition is the good way uh, to, uh, to do both. Um, but, you know, we, we need to also to trust, to trust the ability of, uh, of people uh, to, 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 uh, to find jobs. Don't, don't forget that workers are economic agents. Uh, and uh, if you incentivize them to, uh, uh, to, to, to stay home, they will stay home and they will be right. <laughs> if on the other hand, you incentivize them to find jobs, they will find jobs and they will be right to find jobs. Don't forget that as of today, uh, many companies cannot recruit people. Uh, this is true in the US, this is true in Europe. I have a personal experience of this because I have a small uh, factory on, on the wood business. Uh, we have a lot of work to, to do, uh, but we, it's very difficult for us to recruit people uh, because at the moment people are incentivized to, to, to stay home being paid. And I know this is the, uh, the same issue in the US, for, for example. At some point, it has to stop. People need to be incentivized to work, which means that, for example, they also need to, pay, to be paid more. Uh, as of today, in most of our countries, the difference uh, in terms of income, uh, if you are working or if you stay home, is not uh, motiva motiva enough motivation. Uh, you, you see my point. So we also need to leverage um, the uh, workers, our economic uh, agents, as efficient economic agents. Uh, so I think that there are plenty of, of solutions. And, and then, of course, we need to invest on green uh, startups on, on, on green companies, on sustainable SMEs. This is what we are uh, accelerating on, on generally because investing uh, on this uh, new uh, green and digital environment is also the best way to create new jobs. After that, we need to manage, as I said, the transition because some we need to prepare people to get those new, those new jobs. So we also have to invest a lot in, in training people. This is really important. I think that we need to include more uh, social rationals into economic rationals. Uh, OG, uh, OG, today, the, the responsibility of the CEO is not only to increase uh, the, the net profit of the company. Uh, you cannot... Uh, uh, do this kind of thing only, you need to have a vision on uh, workers, how you create jobs, how you train people, how you prepare them to take the new jobs. This is a social role. Uh, a CEO role is more social than ever. Quite, uh, quite amazing words, higher salaries, more training for employees. I mean, this is um, uh, quite a new world um, for, uh, and it's, it's important to hear that from you. Uh, but let's talk a bit further then about, um, about the investment side of it. Um, and I think as you 
strongly pointed out, um, there's huge investment needs um, in the greening. Um, uh, those investment needs, there's important transition elements to it, but there's really a long-term investment uh, need. So, so a reorientation of our investments into a different direction. And so you mentioned insurance industry um, is a long-term investor. You have a lot of assets um, um, and you have, of course, um, criteria how you invest those assets. Um, and the EU is very proud to advance now its own taxonomy, um, green taxonomy, trying to really um, create also products into which one can invest where one, one has a certain sort of um, guarantee that ESG goals are are fulfilled. So, so where, where do you stand on the, on this front, um, and and you know how do you see that develop? I think um, here we have a great opportunity because, um, as I said, uh, insurance companies are long term investors because they have long term liabilities. Uh, so we can invest <laughs> without looking for liquidity, uh, and I would say we need it because. Uh, uh, if we invest only in government bonds, uh, we will don't uh, we will not get enough uh, um, yields on our investment portfolio. So the diversification of our investment is even more important, and we need to diversify. Not, I'm not saying that we need to increase the risk of our investment. Uh, I'm saying that we need to get more illiquidity premium. We don't want to to, to get more. Uh, premium for risk, for additional risk. We want to get premium for additional illiquidity because we can afford it. So we need it. And on the other side, the economy uh, needs it because when we talk about illiquid investments, we are talking about the real economy. We are talking about the real assets. We are talking about uh, uh, real estate. We are talking about private equity. We are talking about infrastructure. We are talking about private debt. This is the real economy. So the real economy for the recovery purpose uh, needs our long-term capital. And we need to invest our long-term capital in the real economy. The problem is that uh, as of today, the regulation doesn't uh, always allow or incentivize uh, this kind of investment. So we need to create the convergence between the needs of the real economy for long capital and the needs of long-term investors to invest in real economy. And the regulation has to create this convergence. So uh, talking about solvency to regulation, talking about the, the green taxonomy, uh, every uh, everything needs to help these uh, convergence and to organize the meeting between our capital and those uh, and those projects. Uh, I think it's important and at the company's level, it's also important at uh, states, at member states level. Um, so let me give you a, 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 few, a couple of examples. In, in generally, we uh, decided to launch uh, a fund dedicated to the sustainable recovery. The, the name of this fund is uh, Fenice 190, Fenice because it's Venice, 190 because this year we are celebrating our 190th anniversary. And we created a 3.5 billion fund uh, that we will uh, invest in uh, five years, uh, dedicated only to SMEs, sustainable SMEs, green, digital, healthcare, education, green housing, green infrastructure. Uh, and this is really uh, important. We already committed 1 billion. Uh, so we are talking about real money. And we've been very fast. We've been very fast uh, in creating this fund and in committing the, the money. Um, so this is what we can do. We, we will do even more. This is, a, this is a starting point. We've been accelerating the pace of our uh, green investment. Uh, we've been accelerating our uh, climate change uh, targets. So we are completely uh, redirecting uh, our flows of money, of capital on the green, sustainable and, and digital economy. We are doing a lot and we are quite reactive. On the opposite, I think that um, 
Europe uh, has been doing a lot with the, with the European Fund for Recovery, which was a great initiative. And I would say uh, the first uh, real um, economic and, uh, and financial uh, European initiative ever. So it's, it's really important to, co to commit that much money at European level. Now, as you know, uh, most of the European countries are submitting their plan uh, to, to, to Europe. And for example, Italy and France uh, had their plan approved by, by Europe. And this is good. Italy uh, took a significant share of the European fund, for example. So everything is ready to invest the money. The problem is that a state is not very well equipped to invest this money in a short period of time. Uh, and we as uh, insurance company, as long-term investors, we know how to do it. So I've been proposing uh, a few times a uh, public-private partnership in order to accelerate uh, the investment in the sustainable recovery. Let's take the example of our fund, uh, Fenice 190. We decided to invest 3.5 billion in five years. If every time we invest on a, a project, on an infrastructure project, on a, on a SME, every time we invest one euro, the uh, Italian state or the French state or the German, German state decides to invest a euro together with us, this fund becomes immediately a 7 billion fund. Uh, we double the firepower of our fund and we don't lose uh, the speed of investing this money. So it's a proposal I'm going to, 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 to make to several governments, but I think that uh, governments should leverage the capability of the insurance uh, industry, of the asset management industry to accelerate the investment in the sustainable recovery. Yes, um, so, so the, the interplay between the public and the private sector is, of course, a very important uh, topic um, when it comes to greening our economy, um, but also when it comes to, I would say, the speed of um, the decarbonization of our economies, and that is very much driven by um, government regulation as well as the pricing of emissions, of course, and you know, one topic that, that strikes me that uh, should be probably high on your, your mind is the risk of, of stranded assets. Uh, so, so you invest, um, you have a lot, a big portfolio of investment, um, not only in green, there's also some brown um, uh, um, industries in which you invest, um, I assume. And, you know, as, as government action accelerates on the climate front, I mean, how worried is that? Uh, how worrying is that for you in terms of uh, losing some of the assets that um, that you have invested in? I mean, and how can you best sort of steer and manage this process? Well, once again, it's it's a matter of transition and speed of the of the transition. We know oh. the trend. We know the target. Uh, at the end, at some point. Uh, our whole portfolio will have to be uh, green, which means that at some point we will be out of the of the brown. Uh, we need to manage to manage the speed of transition together with governments, uh, together with our customers, together with uh, uh, the companies we invest in. This is really important. I think there there is a key word uh, for uh, everything which is going now. The word the key word is cooperation. Um, you know, I've not always been thinking this way. Uh, when I was much younger, I was believing only in private companies. I thought that uh, uh, government, governments were more an issue, uh, that they were preventing private companies uh, from uh, making more profits and so on. Uh, you know, but I was, the on I was not the only one thinking like this uh, before. I think that we are now in a different world. Basically, we need governance. As private companies, we need the support of governments. In the same time, I think we can support uh, governance. Um, we need to cooperate. Public and private sectors have to cooperate. Uh, 
you, countries have to cooperate. That's why Europe is even more important than before. I don't think that there are national solutions. I believe only in global solutions. Uh, I believe in cooperation through countries. I believe in cooperation between private sector and public sector. This is the only way uh, not only to get out of this crisis, but to build a, a, a real uh, uh, re sustainable recovery. Cooperation is the key of the success. So we are, we are starting to get questions and let me remind our audience, if you would like to ask a question, please go on Slido and type in the code investment and um, then you can type your question and I can see it here on my on my smartphone and ask it to Monsieur, Monsieur Donet. Um, and I, I'll go to that question in a minute, but, but perhaps um, uh, sort of my last question to you is, um, and you mentioned a lot the European uh, level, and um, uh, you know I, I would love to to have your take on um, what is what is still missing on the European uh, level. So there there is of course there's the next generation EU, so a big European fund, and you alluded to it, and the fact that Italy um, and Spain and others have already. Um, uh, uh, received their green light and that will help in the recovery um, but then but then there's other dimensions and uh, I was just wondering you know which and you are of course a global company very European anchored um, um, you know uh, the, you operate not just in Italy but in many many countries um, you know how how well is the European market integrated for you and for your industry, and what are the issues on the, that that you are confronted with when when more specifically about your industry also, um, and what do, what do you think should change there um, so that um, you know the the European market becomes more integrated and more efficient at the end of the day? Because we all talk a lot about sort of capital markets um, being still quite fragmented. But the insurance industry is a sort of one industry that is quite relevant in that space. And so, um, I mean, I, I think our audience would, would love to hear your perspective on, on those issues. Yeah, I think that first of all, as I said it, uh, I'm very optimistic because I think that uh, with this crisis, Europe has been moving forward and they have done things that they never did before. And it gives us a good uh, perspective for Europe. Having said that, we need even more uh, integration in Europe. I'm talking about economic, uh, social, fiscal integration. I think that we need, uh, now we have uh, European bonds, we need the European budget, we need uh, a, Europe, a, Europe, a European Minister of Finance. Uh, we need to stop the tax discrepancies between European countries. What do I mean by that? I think that uh, uh, to have too high tax is not good. And some countries have too high taxes. On the same time, tax dumping is not good as well. So we need to agree in Europe on the tax, European tax framework, uh, which in the same time eliminates too high taxes and in the same time eliminates uh, the tax dumping. So we definitely uh, need this uh, uh, fiscal, social and economic integration in Europe. And I think we can make it because the European technocracy is working well. And basically they, they, they work well because they feel less pressure uh, from the, the, the politics. They are a bit far away from uh, elections and, and, and politics. But it's also, it also can be a problem uh, because in the same time, I think we need to reduce the gap between public opinion and uh, European technocracy. Uh, and this is really important. When you look at the elections, the last elections in France, uh, we realize that only uh, one third of the person are voting. And this is an average, an average. on some region only 20% of the people are voting. This is an issue. This is an issue for democracy. So in, in some case, in some countries, the, the democracy is under pressure. The, if people don't vote, there is a big issue. 
And so we need to rebuild the European democracy. The democracy cannot be only national. It has to become really European. And we build, we need to build a more uh, citizens democracy, democracy. People need to be more, they need to feel more involved in the democratic life, in the political life. And we need to do it as um, the European uh, level. We need to refound the European democracy. So I'm both ambitious for the European technocracy and the European integration and for the European political legitimacy. Right. Um, so a big topic, of course, and uh, now the Future of Europe conference um, uh, is, of course, is, has, of course, started and is starting to discuss some of those issues of legitimacy and efficiency, um, which are as you say, very, very controversial, but I would certainly um, share your view. I mean, uh, um, te technocracy um, alone uh, cannot, cannot do the job and it would be a big mistake um, uh, if we do not um, increase the democratic foundations um, uh, of, uh, of European integration. But let me start taking, taking some questions. Um, uh, I think, um, uh, they they relate to various aspects of what we have uh, discussed, but I think they will be um, uh, useful in in zooming in a bit further on some of the issues. And so so one question here um, uh, by a person called Pierre um, is about uh, what kind of information and depth is required by capital market actors to steer green financial flows and how to avoid an information overkill. Um, not sure I understand the information overkill, but you know what kind of um, information and disclosure and depths in capital markets do we need so that you can steer more better, uh, more 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 efficiently uh, financial flows to greening? Yeah, this is a this is an important uh, an important question. Um, first of all, uh, we we talk uh, to our uh, shareholders, to our investors, and. Uh, uh, they ask us so many questions on uh, what we do on, on sustainability, on green investment, and, and so on. So uh, it's very important to, uh, to be able to, to disclose uh, the right information. And on, on this, the, the, the green taxonomy is really important. We need to uh, decide uh, what is green and what is not green and what is... Uh, uh, very green, <laughs> what is less green. So we, we, we need to have a, a measure, a measurement of, uh, of, of this. And this is really important. We need to build it. Uh, obviously, we need to, uh, to build international standards. This is really important. Uh, but for me, uh, it's important to understand that international standards cannot be American standards, for example. They have to be really international. Uh, so this is really important. And I think that Europe uh, needs to be proactive on this. Uh, I think at some point we will need the uh, rating agencies uh, for um, uh, build this uh, uh, green taxonomy, but the rating, agency, the rating agencies cannot be all American. Uh, they have to be European as well. So we need to take this uh, uh, into account and I think that uh, long-term investors, insurance companies, asset managers need to be to be very proactive in uh, in the taxonomy, in the green taxonomy we, we, we need. Uh, we need to build it together but it has to be uh, really international. Right, um, so clear, clear plea for uh, international rules, not just US rules, but I suppose also not just EU rules, um, and um, and some some clear need for 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 great taxonomy. So we have um, here here two more questions that perhaps I take them together. Um, um, well, one disappeared now. Um, so so. Um, so I think one was about um, the, um, you know, the recovery, the resilience and recovery fund um, again, and you know whether or not I mean so this next generation EU uh, fund in principle, 
and whether or not there it has actually overshadowed or outcrowded some of the domestic or the private uh, schemes. Um, so I think this interplay between the European, the domestic, um, and the um, and the private um, financing, I think that that that's the interest here of a person, an anonymous person. Um, if you can enlarge on that, and and related to that, uh, a person called Catherine is wondering whether you plan to facilitate and or encourage private investment uh, in green bonds or other sustainable um, instruments, and if yes, how? So they are perhaps a sort of giving a, a bit the perspective, the European scheme, the national scheme, the private schemes, and you know, how do, how do they all interplay? Okay. Well, once again, I insist on this idea of speed of the, of the investment. You know, uh, speed is really important in our lives. Uh, I take the example of the, of the vaccine. Uh, at the beginning, we were a bit late in Europe because we didn't understand at the beginning uh, the value of the of the of the time of the timing. Uh, we tried to to buy vaccine at the lowest price, which was not the real issue. The real issue was to get the vaccine as soon as possible. After that, we were able to react, and finally, uh, the European vaccination campaign has been quite have been quite uh, successful. So it's really important to to understand this. The private investment is a fast one. Uh, I give you some some example. Uh, unfortunately, uh, public uh, investment, whether they are domestic or European, are much slower. So it it has uh, less value. Uh, you know, capital in uh, five years or ten years from now has not the same value as capital available immediately. And the and and the projects are there now. We have many projects. We have many requests for for investments. Um, so, once again, I insist on this. We can uh, build a cooperation. I told you about cooperation uh, on investment. Uh, cooperation between private uh, member states and Europe is necessary to invest uh, better and to invest quickly. Of course. What might happen is uh, uh, an, an excess of capital to be, to be invested. What will be the impact of uh, this excess of capital to be invested? It will have a negative impact on the uh, return on investment, definitely. Uh, so on the private equity, the return on investment may not be uh, 30 percent <laughs> it may it may be uh, significantly lower but you, you can live with a lower IRR than 30 uh, percent in a world where interest rates are zero or negative so uh, and this is economically acceptable uh, so at the end what's important is to have uh, this amount of long-term capital uh, but we need to organize the way to, 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 to make it happen. Uh, so far, the money from uh, uh, European fund is, is not, uh, did not arrive eh, in, the, in exactly. the companies on the projects. Uh, Generalist money already arrived in the, in, the, in the project. So you see you see the difference. But it's all about cooperation and uh, uh, we need to, uh, to, to build this cooperation framework. And in general, we are very uh, proactive on this. Uh, on the second question, uh, but the example of green, of green bonds is a good one. In general, we are uh, pushing the idea that green bonds should be a specific asset class uh, with the specific uh, cost of capital treatment for insurance companies. And then I think it's important that as long as people uh, invest in, uh, in unit linked, it's important that we can include uh, green bonds in unit linked. We can include private uh, equity in unit link. We can uh, include uh, infrastructure in unit linked. You know, private investors are definitely willing to contribute to the sustainable recovery, and they are very happy to invest their money in uh, in this kind in the real economy, in the green in the green real economy. So not only the regulation should allow and incentivize insurance companies to to invest 
their money uh, in those kind of assets, but the regulation should also allow the insurance company to put this kind of asset in the funds, in the unit link funds, to make uh, it possible for private investors to invest also in this kind of assets. But, but on this point, I mean, there's another question actually on this point. So let me push you by, by a person called Agatha, and she's wondering, but how do you assess the risks connected to green investments? There are many unknowns um, in green investments and how can they influence investments by the insurance sector? Don't you need safe investments? Um, I mean, isn't it too risky to invest in green? I'm not sure it's more risky than uh, investing in brown. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm convinced that obviously in any kind of investment, we need to measure, to appreciate and to understand the, the risk. But I think the idea that uh, green investments are more risky than uh, brown investment is a, is a mistake. I remember when I was much, uh, when I was younger, uh, personally, I made an investment because I thought it was the safest investment I could make. I decided to invest in uh, uh, German uh, electricity companies because I thought that uh, the German industry was so strong that it would always need electricity, which is true, by the way. <laughs> Having said that, something happened, which was Fukushima. And the day after Fukushima, uh, Mr. Merkel, uh, this, uh, Mrs. Merkel uh, decided to stop uh, the nuclear, uh, the atomic uh, energy in, in Germany and all the electricity companies lost in one day uh, 60%. So I lost 60% of my own investment and I thought it was the safest possible investment. Mm -hmm. So. I think that risk always come from um, somewhere we, we you don't expect it to come. Uh, I think def we have, you know, uh, in asset management and in insurance companies, we have risk management everywhere. We know how to measure risk. We don't want, as I said, we don't want to increase the risk we take when we invest the money. Um, we don't want to get more premium coming from more risks. Uh, so, but green is not more risky than brown. <laughs> green is not more risky than brown. That's a strong statement and an important statement to have it also from you. Um, I have two uh, technical questions here still that I would like to ask, and then I will end with a more general question that um, is also asked by, by one of our listeners. So the two technical questions, and let's take them together, is... Um, one by Sarah, uh, what do you think about the recent trend of insurance companies exploring cryptocurrencies? Um, and a question by Kim uh, is about um, uh, what, are, what about the rules regarding investors' in involvement from outside Europe, like from China and the US? Um, so investors from outside of Europe into the, into the EU. So those cryptocurrencies and those outside investors rules, uh, if you can say a few words about what you think of those topics, and then we end with a more general question. Well, I'm not going to, to comment what other companies are, are doing. Uh, we are not uh, investing in uh, cryptocurrencies in generally, and uh, we, don't not, we do not intend to, to, to do it because uh, we don't understand the risks. Uh, we don't understand the rationale of the of the investment. Uh, we believe, on the other hand, that there is a, a strong uh, value in the blockchain. Uh, the blockchain is something will become, according to me, more and more important, more and more relevant. It will be a, a great way uh, to regulate the flows of money uh, on the, on the capital markets between uh, companies, uh, insurance companies, asset management, uh, customers, uh, distributors, uh, uh, blockchain could be a very a very strong tool to uh, secure uh, money uh, transactions and and flows of money. So I, I believe I strongly believe in in blockchain. Uh, I still don't understand the the, the cryptocurrencies. So this is uh, this is our view in uh, in generally at the moment at the moment. 
um, then uh, on uh, investment coming from out of <laughs> out of Europe, uh, you know, I strongly believe in uh, reciprocity. Uh, if uh, we are allowed to invest in uh, in China, to Chinese should be allowed to invest in uh, in um, in Europe. But you know, for example, uh, we are still not allowed in, in China to own a controlling stake in a, in a joint venture. So uh, why should we sell controlling stakes of European companies to, to Chinese investors? It doesn't make any sense. I think that uh, we need to regulate uh, this kind of uh, um, non-European investment with uh, one word, which is a keyword, reciprocity. It's all about reciprocity. Yes, indeed. Reciprocity, a very important term when it comes to China, which I think um, the political system also very much defends um, in Europe, but um, has not always been able to push through um, on the other side. So this is an important, of course, an important um, a dimension of our relation with China. Um, let me end with, um, I think, a general question by uh, an anonymous listener who is asking, what must insurance companies learn from this pandemic? <laughs> uh, this, is, um, this is a great question. This is a great question. <laughs> um, I think that we, we learn, we probably learn that our role, our mission is even more important than what we thought because we are uh, in actually, we are everywhere in the life of the people, in the life of the companies, in the life of the countries. Our mission is on one hand to protect people um, against uh, many, many risks. And when I say protect, I'm not saying insure because some risks are insurable, uh, but some risks are not insurable by private insurance companies, but they need to be covered because this is the way to, to protect. Um, and I think that we have to do more to protect people. And the pandemic is a good example by itself uh, because uh, we were not able, uh, and I, when I say we, uh, I'm, I'm saying insurance companies, countries, uh, healthcare system, were not able to protect enough uh, people against the pandemic. And we need to build solutions because pandemic, uh, this one is not finished yet, by the way, and then new pandemics will probably come, uh, unfortunately. And we need, we need the world, we need the people to be better protected. So we need to work on building coverage for pandemics. Uh, and we are working on this. Uh, we opened a dialogue uh, with the European Union, with the countries, with the industry. I, generally has been very proactive on this. We want to build uh, in the context once again of uh, public-private cooperation. We want to build a coverage solution uh, against pandemic uh, risks in order to have people more protected. And this has to happen as well for the climate change, uh, for the cyber attacks, for example. And this is the reason why I insist on the cooperation. Uh, thanks to this kind of cooperation, we will build a better protection uh, for people. And this is the heart of the mission of insurance companies. And on the same time, we also learned uh, how important is our role of investors, because not only we are in insurance companies, but we are also investment companies, asset management companies, and our role in uh, investing in the real economy, in the growth of the economy, which means uh, in the building more jobs for people, as well in changing uh, the world for the better, in building a more uh, sustainable, a greener world, our role is very important as well uh, uh, as long-term investors. So I think that we knew it, but we were not as aware uh, of it. Now we became, I think, that uh, even more aware of it. We have a strong responsibility. Uh, we are prepared to, 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 to face it. And we are also very much prepared to cooperate uh, with countries and uh, European Union to, to, to do it even better and even faster. 
Well, um, I think we could, of course, carry on for quite some time, but I'm afraid that um, our time is, is coming to an end. Um, and it was really a, a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you so much, uh, Philippe Donnet, uh, for joining us today. Um, unfortunately, still on Zoom. Um, I hope next time we can do it um, back in Brussels. Um, uh, you said you, you would like to go again at some stage. So, so let's hope that... Uh, that this will will happen and we will have an opportunity to discuss again in person because of course we do miss our, also the personal interactions but let me thank you for the open and frank uh, tour d'horizon if i can say so uh, about uh, a, a big part uh, many many different topics um, the insurance industry more more narrowly but of course the green recovery the investment um, and also your personal experiences it was fascinating and thank you to our audience for listening in and um, for asking uh, so many pertinent questions thank you very much thank you and thank you and